Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome to the last lecture uh, from uh, the web services. And um, today we have two topics. First, I will start with uh, semantic web services, uh, which kind of combine all that uh, we've talked about up to now. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, some modern uh, standard web protocols from, uh, from the last years. Uh, so let's start with the semantic web services. Um, when we want to talk about semantic web services, we uh, need to identify some issues that we have with regular web services first. So uh, when you imagine how you can discover regular web services, and now I again mean the W3C style web services mainly, um, it is using UDDI as the web services catalog. And uh, UDDI, it has uh, web service access to the registry, but it is mainly um, intended to be used by, uh, by people to first find web services they want to use, and then to get their technical specifications in the form of a WSGO file, for instance. And um, um, you can, the, the people can search the registry using key models, so we can find the services using SOAP and services using a particular Whistler file. We can do all that, but mainly uh, then the usage of the web services is manual. Um, so that's web services discovery. And the other is, issue is with uh, web services composition. Um, so when you want to compose web services, first you need to find them. So you can use UDDI or just Google them. Then you need to study the interfaces, so typically in the form of a WSGL file. And uh, then if you have two web services or more uh, and you want to compose them, you need to study the inputs and outputs and create um, some XSLT transformations of those inputs and outputs so that they basically match. And then you can combine them, for instance, using Beeple. So uh, in Beeple, we saw how you can basically um, well connect multiple web services and pass some uh, data among them maybe transform them using xlt and again it is a manual process all this so um for instance here we are creating a web service that uh, um, handles booking of a trip for instance so we want to book a trip and uh, that web service needs to con contact multiple airline web services, then wait for the results, choose uh, the best uh, air ticket, for instance, then uh, the, uh, the, the service proceeds to book a hotel and then it maybe books some uh, reservations at restaurants or some concert tickets and so on. Um, and uh, all this is quite a complex process. Uh, it can be done. Uh, you can study all the input outputs and uh, compose this into a Beeple program, for instance. Uh, it can be done, but uh, then when one of those services fails, uh, basically the whole process fails. And uh, when this is done manually, you again need to basically find a replacement service for, for this particular one. And uh, replace all the um, transformations of the input and output. Um, so this is a problem, of course, uh, especially nowadays when you imagine that uh, you use some of uh, those services and it would say, I'm sorry, one of the services failed. We need to contact the developer. And uh, in one or two months, uh, the, the service will be replaced. Try again then. That's, that's not possible. So uh, the question here is, can this be done automatically? Can uh, we automatically find another uh, service that kind of matches what this original service did? Uh, and can we automatically uh, process or transform the inputs and outputs so that we can use that service? Um, so that's the goal of semantic web services to automate this, uh, this process of discovery of services and their composition. Um, and uh, uh, as, the, as the title suggests, uh, the semantic web services achieve 
this or try to achieve this using semantic technologies, which uh, are RDF mainly. Um, so let's have a booking process like this one. So we book a trip, we book a flight ticket, a hotel, dinner, and a theater. Uh, we can describe those processes using an ontology. And uh, by ontology here, well, under ontology, you can imagine a vocabulary. So an RDF vocabulary that describes all the entities involved in the process and the process itself. Um, okay, so we have the services described using a uh, vocabulary. Now, uh, the services have uh, inputs and outputs. Those can also be mapped to the ontology. So uh, you all did uh, the XSLT, uh, basically transforming some XML output of a web service into an RDF representation using a vocabulary. So like this, you can have all the outputs of all the used web services transformed into uh, well RDF according to that ontology or vocabulary. And um, you can also imagine the reverse. So when you have the data in RDF, you can do a transformation into XML, uh, basically for, for those individual web services. Um, okay, so the idea is that uh, we have the ontology for the domain. So a vocabulary describing bookings and uh, hotels and air tickets and all that. Uh, and we have uh, the process described using the vocabulary and all the inputs and outputs of the used services are also um, well mapped to uh, that vocabulary. Uh, and that uh, vocabulary resides somewhere uh, when the inputs and outputs do not match exactly. And there is also a reasoning engine. A reasoning engine does, um, well, has a set of rules and basically adds more knowledge based on the knowledge that we already have in a uh, store such as an RDF database. Um, we talked about this uh, when we talked about RDFS. So for instance, when you have an instance of a child in a class hierarchy, uh, you can reason about that uh, and say that uh, this, this instance is also uh, an instance of all the parent classes in this hierarchy. So that's one of the possible rules, then and the rules can be more complex. Okay, so the idea is then that uh, we have our regular web services and we sort of wrap them with all those transformations. So we have a, a first web service that produces an XML output. So that's the regular W3C style web service. Then this output is mapped to the ontology. And from um, uh, this also involves transforming the data into RDF. And from that, uh, representation, which should be the same for the whole domain. Uh, it is then transformed back to the individual inputs uh, expected by the used web services. Um, so from RDF, it is transformed, transformed back to XML, but those transformations from uh, the semantic representation into the particular inputs of the individual web services are part of the web services involved in, um, or at least the description of those web services involved in this ecosystem. And this continues. So the web service gets uh, its XML input, produces an XML output. And again, the output is transformed uh, to a representation in RDF according to uh, that ontology. And then again, uh, from, from this representation, another XML file is produced that is served as an input to another web service. So this is the idea of uh, how to handle uh, the heterogeneous data uh, by basically integrating those through the semantic layer through, uh, through RDF. So uh, those individual web services still have different XML inputs, but there are transformations from the common semantic representation to the different uh, XML inputs and from the XML outputs to the common semantic uh, representation using RDF. Um, so that's the idea 
And uh, there is also a way how to actually implement this, or at least partially. And uh, there is a standard for it. It's uh, from 2007, but it is a W3C recommendation. So it is a web standard. And uh, it's called Semantic Annotations for WISL and XML Schema. Uh, it may sound a bit complex, uh, but the implementation or the standard is really simple. It basically uh, defines three attributes uh, that can be used in XML schema or WSGL. Uh, and uh, the first attribute, model reference, basically contains an IRI of uh, a class or a uh, predicate, but typically a class in an RDF vocabulary. And you can use that um, for, let's say, complex types or elements in XML schemas. Uh, or uh, the various kinds of things we can find in a WSGL file. So types, operations, inputs, outputs, and so on. And basically that's the mapping to uh, the ontology because every item in the schema can have a link to um, an RDFS class, for instance, uh, saying, yes, this represents this class on the semantic layer. So that's a mapping uh, that doesn't provide us with uh, the functionality to actually transform the data to the RDF representation, but at least we have some correspondence to the semantic layer. And um, we may, for instance, find uh, web services that deal with the same classes in the RDF vocabulary. Um, and then uh, there is a pair of additional attributes, a lifting schema mapping and a lowering schema mapping. Those two actually link to the transformations. The lifting transformation or lifting schema mapping takes the XML as an input and produces an RDF representation of the data. And the lowering schema mapping takes the RDF representation of the data and produces the uh, XML uh, equivalent of that data. Technically, typically the lifting schema is an XSLT transformation that transforms an XML to, uh, to RDF. That is what you did in the tutorial. So that was a lifting schema mapping. And lowering is the opposite, but technically this is a bit uh, more complex because uh, when you imagine your RDF data, we have the Sparkle query language to work with the data. And uh, well, it does not produce arbitrary XML, right? It can produce RDF XML, or it can produce XML representation of the Sparkle uh, well, solutions table, but that's not exactly arbitrary XML uh, that uh, may correspond to inputs and outputs of a web service. So typically the lowering schema mapping is a pair. A Sparkle query that takes uh, the, the, from a database basically uh, returns the data uh, relevant to a web service and then an XSLT script that takes that data subset and transforms it into a shape uh, acceptable for the web service. So these three attributes are uh, what, uh, what is in uh, SA Whistle. So again, uh, we have uh, our, uh, our process. This is basically a data flow. Uh, so from a web service, we get an XML file, we transform it to RDF and then back to XML. So uh, this from XML to RDF is the lifting schema mapping. And this from RDF to XML is the lowering schema mapping. And those attributes at various places of XML schemas and WSDL point to the transformations that can be used to do that. Uh, technically, uh, those are really just XML attributes. So for instance, here we have an operation in WSDL um, to reserve a hotel and there is a as a WSGL model reference. This is an IRI of a class representing a, um, well, uh, reservation request. Um, and that's it. There is no functionality. That it's just a mapping uh, to the semantic layer. And here we have an XML schema complex type. It has a model reference. So that complex type corresponds to a class in the RDFS vocabulary and it has a listing schema mapping, which is an XSLT file. And the meaning here is that whenever you have an instance of this complex type, so 
an XML element, you can apply this XLT transformation to get an RDF representation of that uh, of the data. And that's it. That's SA whistle. And uh, it is not the only approach uh, to semantic web services, but it is the only one that uh, somehow survived the test of time. Um, historically, there were other approaches to do that, more complex approaches, but uh, they all kind of died. So there was Whistle S, which actually became as a Whistle as the recommendation, the standard uh, in 2007. And uh, then there were two other solutions, Owl S and uh, Wismo, Wismo uh, but they stopped uh, being developed uh, and uh, died eventually uh, when SA Whistle became the standard for this. So there is semantic web services. Uh, now the question is, is this uh, used somewhere uh, in, uh, in practice? And um, I would say no. Um, but the standard is there, and the standard is actually used for something else. Um, when you want to annotate an XML schema uh, that uh, describes an XML representation of some data that you also have uh, in RDF, you can use uh, SA Whistle, and this really is used to actually map those complex types and elements to an RDF as vocabulary. So that is something that is being used. Also, uh, the transformations from XML to RDF and from RDF back to XML, when you need to do those transformations, um, those are the lifting and lowering schema mappings, um, but uh, they are typically executed manually. So uh, the links to those mappings from uh, XML schema or uh, a whistle file are not uh, really used in practice because it's not that trivial to actually automate the process to find the proper element in some XML document to be transformed using XLT and then uh, back again. So uh, semantic web service is not really used in practice, but a nice approach uh, to connecting uh, the XML representation of services to uh, the semantic layer uh, represented by RDF and RDFS. Any questions to this part? No. Okay, so that's it for the semantic web services. And let's uh, move on to the other uh, part of uh, today's lecture. <laughs>